Okay. So, um, just to recall the, the audience, uh, you can formulate your questions either in the chat or just by raise your hand and then you can ask directly to, to Professor Pigmore your question. So then I'm going to switch to Spanish. So, este, bueno, buenos días, es un gusto que estén aquí todos con nosotros. Vamos a, a dar inicio a este seminario de, de curso de Frontiers in Genomics de la licenciatura en Ciencias Genómicas. Y esto, y para mí es un gusto presentar a la doctora Wendy Bidmore, que quien es la directora del MRC of Human Genetics Unit en la Universidad de Edimburgo. Uh, Wendy se graduó en bioquímica en la Universidad de Oxford y su doctorado en biología molecular en la Universidad de Edimburgo. Después de un doctorado en genética humana, inició su grupo independiente en el Linster Institute of Preventive Medicine. Este, tiene una trayectoria impresionante, pero solamente voy a, voy a, 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 a resumir algunos de, de sus, de sus um, de logros y reconocimientos que ha, que ha tenido. Wendy es fellow de la Royal Society del Reino Unido. También es fellow del Royal Society de Edimburgo y de la Academia de Ciencias Médicas del Reino Unido. Es miembro de LAMBO, lo cual es una gran distinción. Y interesantemente, este año, como gobernadora del Linster Institute of Preventive Medicine, recibió el título que da la reina del Reino Unido, le dieron el título de comandante de la Orden del Imperio Británico en reconocimiento a sus logros en medicina y el apoyo a las mujeres en la ciencia. So, como pueden ver, pues, es, es, tenemos el, el gusto de tenerla aquí. Y Wendy, thank you very much to be here, here with us. So now we are ready to, to, to hear you and um, thanks again. Thanks Your very much for that. I'm sure it's a very kind introduction in Spanish. I, I caught little bits of it. So um, it's, it's nice to be joining you to give you this um, general seminar. Um, I really enjoyed meeting the students yesterday uh, and talking about some, some of my work. This talk is going to be a little bit more broad uh, in its remit. And I, I want to discuss with you um, enhancers in general and how they function in both development and disease. So can you see my slide fine? Yes. Yeah, is that good? Good. Excellent. All right, let's get the laser pointer up. You can see the pointer. Yes. Good. So um, I, I'm, I'm located in, in a, a unit that's dedicated to human genetics. So why, why should um, we be studying enhancers in the context of human genetics. So the answer really comes from the worldwide studies that have been done to look at the genetic variation that we all share that affects our risk of developing uh, common and complex diseases of so cancer, neurodegeneration, uh, diabetes, uh, for example. So, so those international genetic exercises were really successful found thousands and thousands of sites in the human genome where variation uh, contributes to our disease risk. But uh, I think what left people scratching their head was that only a very small proportion of those uh, associations were within the part of the genome that we understand, i.e. the coding region, that few percent of the human genome. The vast majority of genome-wide association study hits in the human genome occur outside of the coding regions of genes. Some of them occur in the introns of genes, a few in promoters, but the majority occur uh, outside of genes and often very far away from the nearest annotated gene in the genome, up to a million base pairs away or so. So, so what's going on here in terms of genetics? What, what, are, what, are this, what is this genetic variation affecting functionally? So we think the hypothesis is that these, uh, this genetic variation is affecting the functionality of enhancer elements in the human genome. So what are enhancers? Enhancers are non-coding parts of the genome which regulate the spatial and temporal uh, expression of genes. So they um, are the, the sites where the tissue-specific and cell-specific transcription factors bind alter the chromatin, chromatin structure at the enhancer, uh, allowing the chromatin to open up, 
and then to recruit RNA polymerase and other components of the transcriptional machinery, uh, including co-activators such as the mediator complex. And then somehow through a mechanism we don't yet understand that information about transcription is communicated from the enhancer to the target gene promoter. So obviously if the enhancer is quite close to the target gene, a few tens of KB perhaps, then one can envisage, for example, the transcriptional machinery, perhaps tracking down the intervening part of the genome until it reaches the, its desired promoter to back the fake gene expression. Uh, but if these enhancer elements are millions of base pairs away from the target gene, I think it's very hard to envisage how that kind of linear mechanism you know, can occur. Uh, and so various other hypotheses have been put forward for enhanced promoter communication, uh, including a very popular one in the literature, which involves um, the chromatin looping around such that in space inside the cell nucleus, this distal enhancer actually sits adjacent to the target gene promoter that it's going to regulate. Uh, so I'm going to address this mechanism later on in my talk. So in the human genome, the enhancer uh, landscape for genes can be enormously complicated, particularly for genes which have uh, very complicated expression patterns within development. Uh, and so these are my two favorite exemplar loci in the human genome. On the top there, uh, the PAC6 locus, and on the bottom, the sonic hedgehog. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a bit more about both of these. So uh, PAC6 encodes uh, a master transcription factor, that is important for development of the eye, the pineal gland, the pancreas, and also brain development as well. And to uh, ex execute those functions and to be expressed in the right time and place in development, we know of, of so far over 30 enhancers that, drive, that are required to drive the correct pattern of PAC6 expression in vivo. Um, and these are all these colored ovals here. And, and you can see um, there's various enhancers required to drive expression in different parts of the eye, um, including upstream of the PAC6 gene, in the introns of the PAC6 gene itself, and then also far downstream of the PAC6 gene inside the introns of an adjacent housekeeping gene that's got nothing to do with eye development, for example. And you can see that for, for other types of enhancers as well, such as some of the, some of the forebrain and the hindbrain enhancers for PAC6. So the regulatory landscape for PAC6, we think, uh, extends over about half a million base pairs of the genome. Uh, the sonic hedgehog gene uh, similarly encodes a very important uh, gene product for embryonic development. Sonic hedgehog encodes an embryonic morphogen, which is going to help pattern um, tissues and cells during development to drive cell identity, cell growth. And it's also required in the adult as well for tissue homeostasis. Um, and so far, we know of only 17 enhancers for sonic hedgehog. I bet, I bet there'll be more to be discovered. They've just not been discovered yet. Uh, and those 17 enhancers are in, found inside the intron of the sonic hedgehog gene and then upstream of the sonic hedgehog gene up to 1 million base pairs away. And this most distal enhancer, the blue one, uh, is the famous limb enhancer for sonic hedgehog that drives very specific expression of sonic hedgehog uh, in just a, a small patch of cells in the posterior margin of the limb bud that will help to pattern the limb to, and to dictate the identity of the digits and how many digits there will be. Um, and again, you can see uh, several other enhancers that are located in other genes that have got nothing to do with sonic hedgehog. So this is a you know, really rather kind of bizarre and Baroque kind of organization uh, of the genome, but that's what evolution has cobbled together uh, and it works remarkably well. And in fact, most of our knowledge of how, how enhancers work in the human genome has come from studying important developmental genes like this. So we know of, of many rare, uh, Mendelian disorders in, in, in humans, which are caused not by mutation of uh, protein coding genes, but rather by mutations that affect long range enhancers. And here's just some examples that I'm going to talk you through. It's not at all comprehensive. It just gives you a flavor of what can go wrong in the human genome with regards to enhancer function. So, of course, enhancers don't work if they're not there. So small deletions that remove enhancers obviously prevent correct gene expression. And in fact, perhaps the, uh, the first example of this uh, in the human genome, of course, was the famous uh, LCR element for the beta globin gene. So um, uh, 
Spanish family presented with beta thalassemia, uh, unable to synthesize enough beta globin. Uh, and despite everyone's best efforts uh, at the time, which you know, involved fairly laborious sequencing and southern blotting, uh, there was no defect detected in the beta globin gene itself. But eventually, a small deletion was found 25 up, uh, kb upstream of the beta globin gene, which turns out to be the locus control uh, element for beta globin, where all the enhancers are. Uh, I guess 25 kilobases sounded a long way away at the time, but as you can see, that really uh, is nothing compared with what we know about today. And I think the world record in the human genome uh, belongs to the, that we know about so far belongs to the SOX9 gene. Uh, again, SOX9 encodes a very important transcription factor required for many, uh, many different developmental processes. Um, and uh, in, in Pierre Aban's sequence, uh, there is a failure to express SOX9 uh, in derivatives of the neural crest, which are going to give rise to the jaw. Um, and, and in fact, there's cleft lip palate as well in Pierre Abian's sequence. Uh, and that can be caused by small deletions of, an, of, of a neural crest enhancer of SOX9, located almost one and a half million base pairs upstream of SOX9. I think this is going to be about the limit uh, of reach of enhancers in the human genome. I would be surprised to find enhancers working at more than a roughly about one and a half, maybe two megabases away from the target gene. So um, enhancers are also dosage sensitive. So duplications of enhancers produce severe phenotypes. Uh, so here's uh, another example from, from SOX9. This time, a mere 600 kilobases, so just over half a million base pairs upstream of, of, of SOX9. This doesn't involve neural crest enhancers. Rather, it involves enhancers that drive SOX9 expression in the developing gonad. So we know SOX9 is very important uh, part in, in gonadal determination. So, uh, so a, do not, uh, a duplication of this enhancer produces a sexual dimorphism phenotype in humans. So uh, here also you can see an example from the sonic hedgehog locus, where a duplication of the famous limb enhancer for sonic hedgehog located one million base pairs away gives you a, a severe limb phenotype of polysyndactyly. So enhancers work at great distance, but they are distance limited. So uh, chromosomal inversions, that increase the separation between an enhancer and promoter also break effective communication. Uh, so, so here's an example um, from uh, Sonic Hedgehog Locus where uh, there's been an aversion that's moved the forebrain enhancers too far away from Sonic Hedgehog, resulting in a, in a midline uh, fusion defect uh, in brain development, holo, holoprosencephaly. Um, these inversions can also inappropriately place enhancers next to new genes. And, and there's also an example from Sonic Hedgehog of a limb phenotype caused, caused by what's called enhancer adoption, where uh, uh, a new enhancer has been placed cl close to Sonic Hedgehog. So uh, enhancers work at great distance in cis, but not in trans. So chromosomal translocations that move an enhancer onto, onto a different chromosome uh, also break the system. Uh, here is an example uh, from the PAC-6 locus, where a uh, translocation breakpoint 125 kilobases downstream of PAC-6 separate the PAC-6 gene from a suite of eye enhancers that are required to drive uh, PAC-6 expression uh, in structures of the developing eye, such as the lens. Uh, and here's another example from SOX9 and Pierre Aban's sequence, this time a translocation breakpoint million base pairs upstream of SOX9 that obviously moves the neural crest, separates the neural crest enhancers away from the SOX9 gene. And then last, but by no means least, because enhancers are the sites where the tissue specific transcription factors bind to dictate tissue specificity and cell type specificity, single nucleotide changes in these elements which change transcription factor binding sites also produce severe phenotypes. So these can be loss of function, a mutation. So here's an example from Sonic Hedgehog, where a single nucleotide change in a forebrain enhancer of Sonic Hedgehog, half a million base pairs upstream away from Sonic Hedgehog, which ablates the binding site for another transcription factor, 6-3, produces holoprosencephaly. So again, a failure of Sonic Hedgehog expression during forebrain development, leading to problems in midline uh, development to the brain. But these single nucleotide changes can also be gain of function. So within the limb enhancer of sonic hedgehog, uh, many, new, uh, many mutations have been found in individuals with preaxial polydactyly. So that's uh, too many digits on the hand uh, and also incorrect uh, digit identity. 
Uh, and these turn out to be gain of function mutations that create extra binding sites for ETS transcription factors in this element, making the enhancer, if you like, too good. Um, and then here also is an interesting example of autoregulation, where a single nucleotide change in an enhancer 150 kilobases down, uh, downstream of PAC6 alters the binding site for PAC6. So uh, it turns out that other enhancers can initiate PAC6 expression in the eye, but you need uh, one this particular enhancer to sustain this expression over time. Uh, and so this re results in a severe eye developmental defect called aniridia, which I will tell you about uh, in a moment. So um, can we find more examples of these kinds of enhanced seropathies in the human genome? So we've set about trying to deliberately find them rather than just chance upon them through random um, um, individuals. Um, so we've taken our cohort of aniridia patients uh, uh, as a starting point. So most cases of aniridia uh, in humans, and, and this is an example of aniridia here, which is a, a failure of the anterior segment of, of the eye to develop properly, including loss of the iris leading to uh, a blindness. Um, most, almost most aniridia patients will have a um, loss of function mutation within the PAC6 coding region. So we took our co cohort of patients and excluded those who, where we'd already identified a mutation in the exome, uh, so in the exons of PAC6, and then went and resequenced the enhancers of PAC6 in the remaining patients. Uh, and indeed, already in, in four individuals, we have found single nucleotide changes in these uh, patients um, within conserved enhancers of PAC6 um, that we know to be eye enhancers. So the, we suspect these are the cause of the aniridia in these patients, but each of these patients is at N equals one. So um, we don't have good enough evidence to be able to report back to the families affected by these uh, mutations to say that we can, with real confidence, we can be sure this is the cause of disease. And we'd like to be able to do that. So we're not going to be able to do it based on genetics because each uh, each mutation we've only got one case of. So we're going to have to use some experimental evidence to help support this argument. Uh, so this is the work of a research fellow in my lab, Shit Prabhatia, who set about doing this. So we realized that because these enhancers work so exquisitely in time and place during development, we in general do not have an appropriate cell line in which to assay their function. So we, we really strongly believe that in many cases, you have to have in vivo assays for enhancer function and dysfunction. So we could, for example, go about uh, recreating these mutations in the mouse and assaying eye, eye development, but this would be um, slow, use a lot of mice and be quite expensive. We wanted something that was a bit more high throughput uh, and quicker, and that would give us, give us a little bit more access uh, into the early stages of development. So we've turned instead to zebrafish, and uh, this work is on the bioarchive as a preprint if you want to see it. So what, in, what uh, Shipra has developed is a lovely reporter system uh, for the zebrafish, uh, in which we can pit two different enhancers against each other. So these might be two different enhancers, or they might be a wild type and a putative mutant version of the same enhancers. These two enhancers are separated by, uh, from each other by a very strong insulator, which is actually uh, the insulator first identified in, in the chicken globin gene by Gary Felsenfeld and, and binds, recruits lots of CTCF. It works very nicely in the fish. Uh, and then we have one enhancer driving uh, GFP, and we have the other enhancer driving cherry. And then we can integrate uh, this construct into a precise uh, landing site in the zebrafish genome uh, as a single copy so that we, we've got nice, um, robust and reproducible results. So uh, this is to show you how, how well this works. So here we are comparing two different PAC6 enhancers against each other. Uh, this enhancer here uh, is thought to be a, a neural uh, enhancer for Sonic Hedgehog, uh, for PAC6. Uh, and this Simo enhancer here in blue is an eye enhancer for PAC6, which actually we know is active in the developing lens. So can we assay the two activities of these enhancers in our zebrafish construct? Yes, we can. So here is the result of the neural uh, tube enhancer driving GFP and the lens, enha lens enhancer driving cherry. And this is the result of the transgenic fish. And I hope you will agree that you've got a beautifully exquisite GFP expression uh, in the neural tube with no GFP signal leaking through into the lens. 
And in contrast, we've got lovely red cherry signal in the developing lens with no bleed through into the developing neural tube. Um, and I can tell you, I'm not showing you the data here, but if we take this insulator away, we just end up with yellow in both places because these enhancers cross talk to each other. So the assay works, works very well for comparing different enhancers against each other. And of course, the beauty of, of the zebrafish is you can follow the activity of these uh, enhancers uh, live in the developing zebrafish embryo because uh, the embryos are transparent. And because it's a, a, a non-invasive assay imaging, we can actually follow these same embryos over time and make videos of how these enhancers change their activity as development progresses. So very powerful assay. Uh, and we can, we're also now beginning to uh, extract these cells from the transgenic fish uh, by, by fax and subject them to single cell RNA sequencing. So we can really understand what these cell types are, uh, which the enhancers are active in. Uh, so that's all very well, two different enhancers against each other. But what about trying to oops, prove that we can detect, we can um, determine whether a single nucleotide change in one of these elements is might be pathogenic. So here I'm turning to one of the aniridium mutations that we discovered in our cohort, where there was a single nucleotide change in um, this highly conserved element, SIMO here, uh, located downstream of PAC6. Uh, that, that, that should drive expression in the developing uh, lens. Uh, and so uh, here is the results of this experiment. So in the, uh, when the wild type uh, element drives cherry and the mutant element drives GFP, you'll see the developing lens of the fish is red and not green. And now if we swap everything over and let the wild type element drive GFP and the mutant element drive cherry, the developing lens is now green and not red. So I think this is good experimental evidence that this single nucleotide change that we've picked up as a de novo mutation in a patient with aniridia uh, abrogates the ability of this enhancer to drive correct expression in the lens. So adding real you know, good evidence on top of the genetics that this is indeed the pathogenic change which le is leading to disease in this patient. So I think we have uh, a bit of a pipeline that allows us to do this. So conclusions of this part of my talk are mutations enhancers contribute to Mendelian disease. We think enhancers need to be assayed in the right biological context. And it looks to us like zebrafish might be a good system for really quantitative assay of uh, assays of enhancers activity uh, and also the dynamics of enhancer activity. Uh, so that's all very well for studying rare diseases like this, but let's go back to wh where I started with GWAS and look at common disease and the, and the um, single nucleotide variants, the, the SNPs, the polymorphisms that lead to that. So what I've shown you is by studying, we, we can study uh, in our assays rare alleles that cause Mendelian disease because, of course, they have a very strong phenotypic effect size. They cause mutation, avert mutations. Can we apply the same principles, though, to studying common variants that de facto have very modest uh, effects on effect size? Uh, they wouldn't be common in the population if they had large effect sizes. And we think we can. Uh, so I'm going to illustrate this with one particular example, again, uh, in the eye, but a different trait uh, this time. So here we're looking at a quantitative trait uh, in, in the human population, which is the thickness of your cornea. So most people will have a cornea that's, that's roughly uh, 500 microns thick. Uh, but you can see it's a, it's a Gaussian distribution. Um, once you get below about 500 microns in thickness, the eye becomes keratoconic. So this is um, a, a complex trait, if you like, in a common disease. Um, so when, when the cornea becomes really thin, it loses its, its structural integrity. It loses its shape, uh, leading to abrasions and eventually uh, loss of eyesight. So this is actually uh, a major cause, for example, of corneal transplants in, in, in ophthalmology. Uh, what's nice about the cornea is it's a really simple tissue. It's only got really three types within it. It's got the uh, epithelium, corneal epithelium on the outside. Uh, there's a single cell layer on the inside, which is the endothelium. And then most of the thickness of the cornea is made up of this stroma, uh, of, which is, made, which is uh, made up of collagen fibrils, embedded within which are fibroblasts like cell type keratocytes, which synthesize that collagen. Um, so, you, you know, if you wanted to look at which cells might be responsible for altering the thickness of cornea, you might think the keratocytes would be a good guess. Uh, in fact, you would be right, as you'll see. OK, so uh, typically, so, here, so here's some genome wide association studies that, that my institute and others have performed for both central cornea thickness and for keratoconus. 
Um, they come up with very similar loci. And I'm going to show you the, uh, our example of following up one of these. Uh, this is this locus here on human chromosome 16, labeled here as ZNF469 yeah, in, both, in both studies here. Um, typical of genome-wide association studies, uh, the lead SNPs uh, from this genome-wide association uh, don't map to genes, but map to a large uh, gene desert, an intergenic gene desert, pretty much midway between two candidate genes, BAMP and ZNF469. So the first thing you need to determine is which of the genes is affected by the genetic variations uh, in, the, in this interval here. Uh, and we think Mendelian disease is a good guide to this because we know that auto autosomal recessive mutations within the coding region of ZNF469, which lead to loss of function, give you um, a, a very severe Mendelian disorder called brittle corneal syndrome, where the cornea is so thin that it becomes completely sclerotic and useless. And so, so it's a really quite devastating uh, disorder. There's also other connective tissue defects. Um, so um, we think ZNF469 is the effect, a gene affected by genetic variants at this, this site. Uh, and we, we, we guess that the keratocytes might be the right cell type to look in. And indeed, when we look within the cornea at where ZNF469 is expressed, it's only expressed in the keratocytes. It's not, for example, expressed in the uh, corneal epithelium. So it looks like we might have the appropriate cell type. And this time, actually, we have a cell line that we think might be appropriate. So these are um, telomerase immortalized human primary corneal keratocytes that we can perform experiments in. So how can we determine uh, how these genetic variants are functioning? Uh, so what we did is we performed an assay called ATTAC, ATTAC seq um, and This is a, is a really lovely assay, quite simple to perform, which allows you to find where in the genome chromatin structure has been disrupted. And if you remember at the beginning of my talk, I said one of the first things that happens to an enhancer is that pioneer transcription factors bind and um, displace nucleosomes. So attack can be a very good way of finding active enhancer elements in a particular cell type. So we applied attack seq to um, prime uh, corneal keratocytes. So these are two replicates, uh, and we also applied them to what we think is an inappropriate cell type, which is the corneal, corneal epithelium. Uh, and as you can, hope you can see here, we've got some very nice keratocyte specific attack seek signals indicating active, enhan active enhancer elements in this region of the genome that are specific to the keratocytes and that are not found uh, in the corneal epithelium. Uh, and these peaks here overlie two of the lead SNPs from the, from the genome-wide association studies. So then we, we took this region of the genome, uh, we put it into our zebrafish assay, and now rather than pitting two enhancers against each other, enhancer A versus B, or wild type enhancer versus um, what we think is a, a de novo a mutation in enhancer, we're comparing two haplotypes from the human genome. Uh, the haplotype at this region that's associated with thick cornea versus the haplotype that's associated with the thin cornea. And I hope you can see in the zebrafish assay that the haplotype uh, associated with thick cornea drives high level expression in the developing eye uh, and the haplotype associated with thin cornea does not. So we think we're able to measure uh, this quantitative variation in this uh, SNP that can help us to understand the genome wide association signals. So the conclusions here are that variants in enhancers contribute to common disease risk. Again, we think they probably need to be assessed in the, in the correct biological context, be that in vivo or in cell lines. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, zebrafish seems to be a good system for these kinds of quantitative assays of enhancer variants. Okay, so now to the question about mechanism. So how do these enhancers actually work when they are hundreds or thousands of kilobases away from their target gene? Uh, and does this involve uh, th this popular looping model? So this uh, takes me to introducing to you some uh, facets of the three-dimensional organization of the human genome. So one of the most exciting things that's, that's happened in my field in the, in the last uh, few years has been the discovery um, through chromosome confirmation capture assays that our genome is organized into topologically associated domains, uh, which are these red triangle structures uh, that we see in these chromosome confirmation assays. So this is um, 
high C, uh, which is uh, probably the most powerful chromosome confirmation ca capture assay, high C data uh, across uh, an exemplar locus, one that I introduced to you earlier, the Sonic Hedgehog region. Um, and, and this is a topologically associated domain here. How are topologically associated domains made? They're made by the action of a machine called Cohesin, an ATPase driven uh, molecular machine that moves rapidly up and down our genome, uh, entrapping chromatin. And then as it moves, the chromatin is spilled, spooled through the, the ring in the middle of Cohesin. So Cohesin moves very fast and is processive, but is stopped when it hits um, a barrier. Uh, in, in, in the human genome, many of these barriers, so this is the edge of these triangles, are made up of the binding sites for the zinc finger transcription factor CTCF in a particular orientation with the motifs pointing inwards. Uh, and so this fits very well at sonic hedgehog locus. So the left hand boundary of this TAD is made up of CTCF site one, and the right hand boundary is made up of CTCF sites four and five. And what you'll see is that even though the regulatory landscape for sonic hedgehog is very large, very complicated, all of the enhancers for sonic hedgehog lie in the same topologically associated domain as the target gene sonic itself. So this indicates that there must, must be something about these structures that is related to the ability of enhancers to activate genes and particularly at long range. And indeed, this is found at other developmental genes as well, and has led to the hypothesis that perhaps one of the functions of topologically associated domains uh, are to change chromatin structure such that enhancers within a TAD are readily able to activate a target, target gene within their own TAD. And uh, also that um, this uh, boundary between two TADs acts to prevent enhancers in an adjacent uh, TAD uh, ectopically, uh, inappropriately activating a gene in the next door TAD. So a very appealing model uh, and one that we wanted to test in our system. So um, we can't just delete all CTCF or all, all, or all cohesin from the genome uh, and ask how sonic hedgehog expression in the developing embryo is altered because both CTCF and cohesin uh, are essential genes and, and are embryonic lethal. So we decided instead to just alter the structure of the TAD which Sonic Hedgehog sits in. And we decided to do that by mucking around with the CTCF sites that delineate this TAD. So we used CRISPR-Cas9 to uh, systematically delete uh, each of the CTCF sites, so one, two, three, four, five, individually in different cell lines. So we, we took, uh, for example, site one away uh, from both alleles in mass embryonic stem cells. And then we made a separate cell line where we took both copies of site two away. We're in the process of making combinations of these deletions within the same cells. But I'm gonna show you the data uh, that was published a few years ago uh, from site one. Uh, and the data are actually exactly the same if you look at what happens when you take site two away or site three or site four or sort of site five. So first of all, does taking away that boundary CTCF site alter the TAD boundary? And the answer is yes, it does. So these are our chromosome confirmation capture assays from wild type mouse embryonic stem cells. So here's the sonic hedgehog TAD. Ignore the white lines, that's just where there are repeats in the genome that means we can't map reads. Um, so it's the red data that you want to look at. Um, and now here's the same experiment done from an ES cell line where both copies of CTCF site one are missing. Uh, and I hope you can see marked by this arrow here that this less this left-hand TAD boundary uh, has been lost or essentially or certainly weakened. Uh, and the boundary is now moved to this, this uh, point here, which is CTCF site two. And conversely, uh, a new interaction has been formed between Sonic Hedgehog uh, and all the sequences to the left-hand side. So Sonic Hedgehog has essentially joined this TAD over here and left its own TAD. And you can see this more clearly here, I think, in this difference plot of the two uh, chromosome confirmation capture data sets. So uh, blue is a loss of interaction in the CTCF mutants and red is a gain of interaction. So here, if you look at Sonic Hedgehog, you can see this blue stripe. So that Sonic Hedgehog losing the interaction with all its, uh, its, its own TAD, including all its normal enhancers and gaining interaction with this TAD over here, including all the enhancers that are located over here.
<clears throat> so that's that's good. We've changed the, the 3D genome in the way we wanted to. Uh, we were able to make uh, embryos from these mutant cells, and we could also show by imaging that we'd also altered the structure of the sonic hedgehog region. So here is looking at three probes within the TAD, sonic on the left-hand side of the TAD, the limb enhancer to the right-hand side of the TAD, and SB2 located in the middle of the TAD. And you can see in wild-type cells, all three probes close together. So these TADs are quite compact structures. So one of the things that the cohesin-mediated loop extrusion is doing is keeping all this chromatin close together. And that's probably contributing to a lot of the interactions we pick, we pick up in chromosome confirmation here. And now if we do the same thing on the mutant CTCF uh, site one cells, you can see this TAD falls to bits, it decompacts. And now if we go into a particular tissue where we know a specific, a specific enhancer is important for regulating sonic hedgehog expression, we can also see altered proximity of the enhancer and the promoter to each other. So um, we had previously shown many years ago that uh, in this patch of cells here, which is called the zona polarizing activity, and is located on the distal posterior margin of the developing limb bud, both the forelimbs and the hind limbs, we find a very high spatial co-localization by imaging of the, limb, the distal limb enhancer with the gene it's going to regulate. Remember that limb enhancer is a million base pairs away, uh, but in a very high proportion of, of alleles, the enhancer and the promoter seem really close together. And by co-localized here, I mean within about 100 nanometers of each other uh, because we're using super resolution microscopy here. So, so that's, we thought at the time, this was really consistent with the looping model that would bring the enhancer very close to the uh, promoter. Now, if we re repeat that same assay in the developing limb buds of our mutant mice, our CTCF1 mutant mice, we now see a big drop in the uh, proximity of the sonic hedgehog uh, limb enhancer to sonic hedgehog gene itself. So therefore, million dollar question, what does that do to the ability of sonic hedgehogs enhancers to activate sonic hedgehog during development, including during limb development? Uh, and the answer was uh, absolutely nothing as far as we could tell. Uh, so despite making five different mutant mouse strains with uh, CTCF sites deleted when we looked uh, in these developing embryos at where sonic hedgehog was being expressed. We couldn't see uh, any. Uh, no, no, oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. Are you okay? Okay. Yeah, we, yes. we, we, could, we couldn't see any difference between uh, the wild type and the mutant embryos. And here, if you look in the developing limbs, uh, you can see um, sonic hedgehog is, is perfectly able to be expressed and activated by the limb enhancer, despite the fact that we've reduced the interactions. Um, so we concluded from this really that um, this simple model where the TAD uh, boundaries are very important to, to allow enhancers to contact the target genes doesn't seem to be quite correct. Now, um, we'd like to more dramatically alter structure. So how can we do this? I already told you we can't completely remove um, CTCF from the cells uh, constitutionally through standard genetics. Even using Cree locks, it's very challenging. Um, so is there another way to do this? And so we've ado adopted a, a completely orthogonal way of uh, doing this using a really exciting new technology for the field, which are orcs in degrons. So orcs in, orcs in degrons are a small, um, uh, motifs that you can fuse to your target gene of interest that allow that that protein to be degraded by the proteasome in the presence of the small molecule auxin uh, and this had been uh, used to to look at what happens to mouse embryonic stem cells when you acutely remove ctcf from these cells and uh, been done by two different labs here uh, and one of the things as well as showing the uh, feasibility of this approach they uh, also looked at gene expression when they did this, and they reported actually that acute depletion of CTCF had rather minimal effects on steady state transcription in these cells. Um, but what they didn't look at was the ability to activate de novo a gene through an enhancer. And that's something that we wanted to look at. So um, moving away from the embryo per se, because we can't do these orcs in degrons at the moment uh, in vivo in the developing mouse, but we can apply them to mouse embryonic stem cells, for example. And we have in the past been able to uh, activate sonic hedgehog uh, enhancers, and particularly the neural enhancers, by uh, driving mouse embryonic stem cells to be neural progenitor cells. And we published this a few years ago. Um, 
that's all very well, but it doesn't give us very much control over the system. We have to wait for five, five to seven days for these cells to differentiate. Um, so it didn't, doesn't give us much control. <clears throat> so we want something that gives us the ability to turn on, turn, turn on a sonic hedgehog enhancer with uh, much faster kinetics, similar to the kinetics we can use to deplete proteins from the cell using oxyndegrons. So we've turned to a synthetic system where we synthetically activate sonic hedgehog in mouse embryonic stem cells where it's not normally expressed by directing a, a synthetic transcription factor to either the promoter sonic hedgehog or to its enhancers. We make our synthetic transcription factors out of tal effector proteins, which we can design to target a unique 14 base pair sequence in the human genome. And we fuse that to a very strong viral acidic activator to turn it into a transcription factor. Uh, and, and if you want to see how, how we did this, you can look at this paper here. This works really well. This is showing you uh, the examples where we uh, introduce our synthetic transcription factors either to the promoter sonic hedgehog, to this enhancer 100 kilobases away, or to this enhancer here half a million base pairs away from sonic hedgehog. And you can see we nicely activate sonic hedgehog expression when we do this. So this is at the promoter, this is at the enhancer 100 kilobases away, this is at the enhancer 500 kilobases away. So that's good. So we have complete control of, of how we activate sonic hedgehog and when we activate sonic hedgehog. And now we want to, um, first of all, ask, can we extend this to the limb enhancer of sonic hedgehog located all the way over here? And now we are assaying sonic hedgehog activation using RNA fish so that we can uh, assay this at the level of single cells and single alleles. So I hope you can see with the white arrows evidence that here we can activate sonic hedgehog using a synthetic factor bound almost a million base pairs away, but within the same tad as sonic hedgehog. This, this experiment I'm going to tell you about is unpublished, but it's on the bioarchive. Okay, so now we can want to combine this with quickly removing CTCF from the system uh, using an oxyndegron. Uh, and here you can see it works really well. Within six hours of adding orcs into these cells, uh, all the CTCF has disappeared as judged by facts and also by imaging. So now we can go uh, uh, and we can also see by the chromosome confirmation capture that the structure of the topologically associated domain has changed. You can see the blurring of the boundaries of the TAD and you can see the decompaction of this TAD by imaging. And now we can do the experiment to activate sonic hedgehog synthetically and ask in, in the absence or presence of auxin and ask what happens. So this is RNA fish data. This is a control gene over here, which we don't expect to be affected. In fact, it's the gene LMBR1, the housekeeping gene on the other end of the tad within which the limb enhancer sits. Uh, these are control tiles where we don't include the VP60 in activation domain, so just to control for tile bind binding. Uh, and this is the real experiment here, minus auxin plus auxin. Uh, and, and this is when we put the factor at the promoter sonic hedgehog. This is at the forebrain enhancer 500 kilobases away, and this is at the limb enhancer a million base pairs away. And you can see there's no significant difference in the uh, presence or absence of CTCF. So consistent with what we found by deleting CTCF sites, we don't think that CTCF is essential for long range enhancer activation. What a, but what about uh, cohesin itself, the engine that's going to make the topologically associated domains? So same experiment, uh, we uh, have some cohesin that's tagged with an auxin degron that we got from Rob Post's lab. We can add auxin to these ES cells. All the cohesin is removed within six hours by both facts and by imaging. And so now we can combine this with our synthetic transcription factors, sorry, and this is the chromosome confirmation capture to show an amazingly dramatic change in structure when you remove all the co cohesin. The tads just melt away, they're essentially not there anymore. Uh, and we can see by imaging this, this large scale unfolding of this chromosomal region. And now when we do our synthetic activation, we find a really interesting result. We find the ability to activate sonic hedgehog by landing the transcription factor on the promoter of the gene is not affected by the loss of cohesin, but we're no long, longer act, able to activate sonic hedgehog at a distance through these distal enhancers if there is any not any cohesin anymore in the cells. So this suggests that sonic hedgehog uh, that loop extrusion is required for long distance loop uh, long distance enhancer activation. So does that mean that we need cohesin for activating all enhancers or is this about genomic distance? So to answer that, 
we uh, explored uh, one of these enhancers here, only 100 kilobases upstream of Sonic Hedgehog repeated the same experiment. Uh, so this enhancer is called SBE6. Uh, and here we find, so this is um, uh, in wild type cells, just uh, minus and plus auxin, there's no auxin effect. And now when we deplete cohesin in these cells, we find we're still able to activate Sonic Hedgehog synthetically from this enhancer. So this is a not about a requirement for cohesion for all enhancers, it's about a requirement for cohesion for enhancers that are a long way away, uh, more than 100 kilobases away. We obviously don't yet know the exact cutoff point here. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, ignore this uh, for now, um, maybe just focus on this here. So, so if you look here, this is the, the quantification of fish imaging data from this experiment. So. Um, and this is the control tower without an activation domain on it. So you can see when we remove cohesin uh, with auxin from these cells, we can see the region decompact. Uh, and, you can, and, and, we, and we see that by imaging here. If we do the same thing with the actual synthetic transcription factor with VP64, we find that cohesin actually doesn't have any additional effect on the spatial relationship of the gene and the enhancer. Because compared to the empty tau, the, the mere presence of the transcription factor of this distal enhancer causes this region of the genome to unfold. And indeed, this is what we had seen in this paper a couple of years ago. To our surprise, when we synthetically activate sonic hedgehog from an enhancer, we don't find the two come together. We find they get further apart from each other, completely against the popular Lupin model uh, for how long range enhancers work. So uh, what, where does that leave us in terms of how uh, enhancers work and the role of TADS? Well, we, we still don't have definitive in, enhancers, but we think that loop extrusion, the process of loop extrusion, not the final structure of the TAD and the CTCF size, but actually the process of making the TAD and the compaction that occurs as a consequence of that is important to bring enhancers close enough to their target genes. We don't know what close enough is, but probably the order of 200 to 300 nanometers away from each other. That allows enhancers and promoters to communicate with each other through some mechanism that seems to, to paradoxically involve the enhancer and the promoter moving further away from each other. And in fact, uh, that model that we proposed a couple of years ago is very similar to a model that others in the, in the field, including Rick Young, have been proposing that suggests that enhancers work to activate genes through a phase separation mechanism. The enhancers act as, as scaffolds um, to nucleate uh, phase separated drop, drop, liquid, liquid phase separated droplets, um, within which transcription factors, coactivators, and RNA polymerase rise to high concentrations. Uh, and that, that can then diffuse and activate promoters that are engaged in the same droplet. So in these models, there's no reason, reason that an enhancer needs to physically come and sit on top of a gene promoter, rather an enhancer promoter merely have to engage in the same volume within the cell, which and these, these condensates may be of the order of several hundred nanometers in size. So I think that the field is coalescing around this new model of enhancer promoter activation. So uh, to the, my last conclusion here, the relationship between TADS and gene reg regulation is unclear. We certainly need cohesion to activate long distance enhancers. A simple looping me mechanism doesn't seem to account for enhancer promoter communication. It's a more com complex three dimensional relationship. And in, we think that enhancers might just have to be close enough in space to activate their target genes. So if we really want to understand what close enough actually is. And we, we suspect, but don't have the definitive evidence yet that enhancer promoter communication may involve phase separation transcriptional hubs. So lots to be discovered in this area, but it's a really exciting area to be working in where there's a, been a convergence of genetics, um, um, cell biology, and also biophysics now. So I'm just gonna end there and thank the people in my lab who've contributed to this work. Uh, the zebrafish work uh, on enhancers and variants was, is led by Shipra Bharti in my lab. Um, together with uh, Anita, uh, funded by the New Life Charity. And then all the work on cohesion mediated loop extrusion uh, is a collaboration between my lab and Bob Hill's lab, uh, Laura in Bob's lab, Ian Williamson, postdoc in my lab, together with Sheila Boyle, my technician, uh, and Ilya Fliema. And um, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. And I will try and stop sharing my screen so I can see you all. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. Very nice, fantastic seminar. Thank and, you. Um, so now the, 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 the talk, the seminar is open for questions. And uh, as I said, you can raise your hand or either you can put the question in the chat. I think there's one in the chat already. Um, it, okay. It is, um, okay, are TADs considered to be static structures? Good question. Absolutely not. No, they are, they are not. So there's triangles that you see uh, on those chromosome confirmation matrices are an, an ensemble from a whole population of cells. Uh, so they are absolutely dynamic. So cohesion's moving along all the time and being removed. So these TADs are being made and destroyed all the time. So they are really, really dynamic. And I think that's one of the difficult features for the kinds of studies that we're using because we are using assays like chromosome confirmation capture or fish where we have to kill the cells you know, fix them in formaldehyde. So we lose all the dynamic information. And, and really one of the dreams is to be able to do these kinds of experiments and be able to follow enhancers and promoters inside the nucleus in live cells. Uh, big technical challenge, but something we're trying to work towards. So maybe we can uh, uh, take one question from, from Kasia Octava. So one on one, one from the chat and one from the audience directly. Kasia? Hi, Wendy, this is Kasia Oktaba. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, in these transcription hubs that you are proposing, or the yeah. field is proposing, uh, how do you imagine that repressors and activators work? Because, you know, in the case of where you have many enhancers that are tissue specific, and yeah. you need some to be repressed and some to be activated, how do you imagine yeah. that? Yeah, so this gets to the very interesting question about enhancer promoter specificity. So why, why do the sonic hedgehog enhancers activate sonic hedgehog, but not the other genes that are in the same TAD? Um, so the answer actually turns out to be rather interesting. It's not that, the, that, that there are repressors at, at the enhancers, but rather there are repressors at the other genes. Because if we drop a transgene reporter into this region, the mouse genome with a, you know, um, a kind of minimal promoter like the beta globin promoter uh, and, and let it drive black Z, then no matter where you put that transgene in the TAD, it will be activated by every single sonic hedgehog enhancer. So you'll see it everywhere uh, where sonic hedgehog is activated. That's, so that says that actually no enhancer promoter specificity per se, rather that the genes that are not gonna be activated have to become deaf to the enhancers in some way. Um, and we absolutely don't know what lies at the heart of that. It's a really interesting question. Thank you very much. So now a question from the chat. So this is one from the YouTube, from Adrian Diaz. Do you want yep. to, or you read it? From I, I can read it. Have we observed that if eliminating a TAD boundary, we get an enhancer in a different TAD having an effect on a gene? So yeah, so now we put Sonic Hedgehog into a, the wrong TAD. Does it, by, by removing that boundary, taking away CTCF site one, does Sonic Hedgehog now get activated by the enhancers in the next door TAD? And the, and the answer was no. So, so that part of the model was also wrong. Okay. Quite surprising, but yeah. <laughs> Next question from Felix Resillas. Hi, hi, one more time. Thank you for your talk. Um, based on your conclusion about the, the contribution of CTCF and, and cohesin, uh, I have the impression that something is missing. Hmm. I would like to, to hear your opinion. Okay. Uh, and, and, and because, as you know, different CTCF sites have different roles, yes. different combinatorials of this. And, yeah. and now you have the combinator between CTCF and cohesin. Yeah. But I, I will add one, one additional parameter that you know perfectly that maybe has something to do. That will be RNA, non-coding RNAs. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, then my, uh, it's not a question I will have. Your opinion is quite mm. important. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's very interesting for sure. If, actually, if you when you look at the chromosome confirmation capture data for the CTCF degron, unlike the cohesin degron where the TAD just disappears, you can still see something that a bit like the, some of the TAD structures still there. And in fact, one boundary is retained much better than the other. So all boundaries are not the same. So we suspect there's something else at the left-hand end of the sonic hedgehog TAD. Now we have done 4SU sequencing on this region to look for things like non-coding RNAs. And we don't see any at that boundary there. There is a non-coding RNA that comes off the promoter of sonic hedgehog in the opposite direction. And that's also induced by the synthetic transcription factors. Um, so that doesn't account for what's, what 
what else is remaining at that left hand boundary. Um, so we would really like to know what's there. Like, of course, we can't exclude some kind of very unstable non coding RNA we can't Oops. detect. Thank you very much. Okay. So the next question is from Edgar Young in the chat. Yeah, what would be the difficulties of inducing loops with CTCF? So you mean making new making new tags by introducing CTCF sites in the genome? I'm, I'm assuming that's what you, you're, you, you mean. So rather than just deleting CTCF sites, why don't we try to re-engineer engineer the TAD, change its structure by introducing new ones? And that's something that we, we're planning to do uh, next. So also one in the chat. Uh, yeah, so this is Adrian Adrian. again. But yeah, what are the main challenges of choosing candidate regions to mutate with CRISPR-Cas9? Um, well, we, we, you know, we knew that the, C, that the CTCF sites were in the right place to be the TAD boundary. So we, you know, we took the CTCF motifs there and we decided to delete a five kilobase window around those. We didn't want to take too much away uh, from these regions. Um, so we're really gu guided by um, where the CTCF mutations are. And we're not making really big deletions with, with dead Cas9. So they were, they were actually really quite easy to make. Okay. On the, on the other question in the chat from Elena. Uh, Elena RG. Yeah. Is it known if other types of sequence, e.g. transposable elements can act as enhancers? That's a great question. And that kind of gets to the, where do enhancers come from? You know, uh, dur during vertebrate evolution, during mammalian evolution, we've just acquired more and more and more and more enhancers. Where on earth did they all come from? And yes, it, indeed, it's thought that many of them came from transposable elements. So we, we don't know if that's the case for the kind of enhancers I've talked about here, for Sonic and Pac-6, but in other systems, such as the enhancers which regulate some of the nuclear hormone receptor responsive genes, Absolutely, you can see evidence that some of these enhancers are derived from Lime 1 or, or ALU elements. So I think that, you know, as we know, transposable elements are a great source of evolutionary uh, novelty and innovation. And that's tr also true of enhancers. It's also thought that other enhancers might be um, old promoters of, of other genes. There, there's actually very little difference between, it turns out there's little difference between an enhancer and promoter. You know, they, they, they both bind factors, they both bind RNA polymerase, they both transcribe RNAs. It's just the nature of the RNAs they produce are rather different. Um, so probably promoters are another source of new enhancers. Well, there, there are two more questions in the, in the chat. One from Esperanza Martinez. Yeah. What is expected from gene therapy directed to enhance neuropathies? Um, well, clearly, um, you, know, in, in, you know, adding in, we can't add an extra gene in because it's for these disorders there, they've got to be the gene that you're adding has got to be expressed at the right time and place. Um, you, I guess you could try making an enhancer promoter construct and using that, but I don't think that's going to be work. But I think, gene, I mean, genome editing should be, possible for correcting some of these enhanced neuropathies where there are single nucleotide changes in these elements. You know, we can go in and re-edit some of those enhancers in the right stem cells, for example. I mean, this is where far down, far down the road. Um, so at, at the moment, we're at the stage of really, you know, trying to help patients by providing diagnosis rather than treatments. And there's a question from Daniel Guzman also. What, what is the role of structure recognition beyond sequence recognition? Oh, I don't know. I, we, it's something we haven't explored at all. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming by structure recognition, you mean things like G quartets and unusual DNA structures? Uh, I, I think, is that the heart of the question? I'm not sure, but it's not something we've explored uh, at all. Uh, and then there's a question from Michelle about, uh, is it known, how the, pro uh, the proteins within the compartments prostrate and a liquid liquid separation model remain in that location if there's no membrane to prevent their free diffusion. Uh, yes, it, it's, it's just the uh, on, on off binding sites, <coughs> excuse me. It's, it's just the, the, the presence of high affinity binding sites and probably multiple binding sites uh, formed by the enhancers that allow these proteins to be retained within 
the droplet and also the interactions between the different factors within the droplet, the interactions with the transcription factors with the co-activators. So it's protein DNA and protein protein interactions that allow these factors to remain at high concentration within the droplet. Of course, they can also move in and out of the droplet, but they remain at high concentration within, at least that's the model. The problem is we can't actually see these condensates uh, at the moment uh, at our target gene loci. So we can't actually go in and measure, for example, transcription factor concentrations. We can't do FRAP to measure diffusion of these factors. And that's something we would really like to be able to do. Okay, so I think that the last question is for me. Uh, oh, I, just, I, see, I see one more hand up. Uh, there's one more? Okay. Yes. This is Cortez. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bigmore, for your great talk. I wanted to ask you if, uh, have you played with the uh, DEDCAS9 that is fused with activators to see if activating these different enhancers on short uh, on SHH would have any um, particular effect to understand how it, uh, those enhancers get activated? For example, if it's the H3K27 acetylation that goes first, is it enough to make a contact right. or something like that? Uh, we, we haven't used dead cas 9 for our experiments. We've used the towels instead to do the same thing. So why haven't we made our life easy and used the dead cas 9 Because we find that it's not, a, not as effective an activator as a towel VP16 when we recruit them to the same places in mouse ES cells. So that's why we've stuck with the towels, even though they're a bit more cumbersome to make. Um, and do we know what comes first? Well, we, we haven't explored everything, but we know when the towel binds, we've done, we've done chip sequencing for K27 acetylation, and we see a beautiful peak of K27 acetylation under where the towel binds. So for sure, it's, it's recruiting P300 there, and we know it's also recruiting mediator. So it's doing all the things you would expect a transcription factor to do. We know that VP16 engages with the tail domain of the mediator complex. Uh, and it probably also recruits P300. So it's doing the kinds of changes to the chromatin structure you expect of an enhancer, but it's only doing it where the tal is bound. And then also at the target gene, we see the K27 acetylation appear as well. Okay, thank you. So then um, I think that the last question is my question. Okay. Uh, this is related to the, your, your presentation yesterday. Hmm. Uh, that this is very interesting that before transcription is activated, the enhancer is close to the promoter. But when yes. the enhancer becomes active and transcription begins, yes. you see a separation of the enhancer from the promoter. Yes. And the question is if uh, uh, this requires the transcription of the enhancer, I mean, the, uh -huh. the presence of uh, enhancer RNA in order yeah. to have this, this thing to happen. Yes, I, I think it may do. It, it's really hard to prove, but yes, that's one of our hypotheses. It, it involves in hearts of RNAs themselves. Um, you know, so we scratched our head when we first saw this, you know, decompaction of the region between the enhancer and the promoter. But actually, if you think, you know, you think to fly genetics, what we're essentially looking at is a heat shock puff or an ectodyson puff. You know, ectodyson binds to an enhancer. And when it when, when that happens, the whole region expands. Um, so I think we, I think we're looking at the same kind of events, you know. So we don't know whether we're losing H1, you know, as, as um, John this has shown at the the heat shock path, whether part of the compaction be, can be accounted for by loss of link here stones and other things. But but I think there is precedent buried in the old Drosophila literature for this going on. Right, right. Okay, I think that's it. That was the last question, and well. One, it was a fantastic talk, I mean, fascinating results. And thank you very much again, uh, Wendy, for participating in this program. And I hope you get a, a good a background from, from what we are doing, what the students do yeah. the program that we have in the uh, Bachelor in Genomic Sciences. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks very much. It was, it was lovely to talk to you. And thanks for your, your interest and your questions. And uh, bon dias. Uh, okay. <laughs> Adios, Wendy. Hope Adios. To see you in person soon. Yes, absolutely. Bye bye. Bye bye. Gracias. Gracias, Mario.